Welcome to Non-Obvious with Hugh Hampton. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to you to this. Uh, uh, I've been a big fan of yours over the years, and I've even told you you're one of the most articulate people I've ever met in my life. <clears throat> um, uh, so it's good to actually have you to be grilled relentlessly here at the, the podcast. Um, first of all, how are things in England now? Uh, here, they're not great. Uh, I'm just talking about the virus and stuff like that. It's uh, pretty bad or what? It's pretty bad here. So uh, earlier this week, we reached the grim milestone of over 100,000 deaths from COVID-19 in this country. Um, hospitalizations are still running close to a record level um, and considerably higher than they were at the peak of the first wave back in April. Um, and although cases have been coming down um, since the third lockdown was imposed um, uh, just after New Year, uh, they are not coming down as fast as everybody would like. And hence the government has been imposing additional restrictions just recently, such as border, uh, further border controls. Um, and in addition, they've had to postpone reopening of schools. So while we are going in the right direction in the sense that the cases are going down, and in addition, of course, uh, our vaccination program is going quite well, nevertheless, as we sit, as I sit here right now, the situation is still quite bad. So in terms of I imagine it's hard, you don't have any trials, for instance, and you're in a court appeal now, but if you in first instance, oh, can you do, I guess you can do a trial by Zoom or something else, uh, or a hearing, uh, correct? Yes, indeed. So, so the, the picture, broadly speaking, is as follows. There's a big difference between civil work and criminal work. Um, so far as civil work is concerned in this country, um, when we had the first lockdown back in uh, March 2020, uh, everything was, was put on hold in most jurisdictions for, for, for a little while. Um, even then, appellate courts carried on. I mean, the Court of Appeal at that stage went down to about a 50% uh, caseload and a number of cases were postponed. But quite rapidly, we adjusted. Um, and these days, we run a full caseload. Uh, for appellate work, as you rightly say, doing it um, by uh, a video platform, uh, I'm afraid to say we are not allowed to use Zoom for this purpose. Um, we're on Microsoft Teams as our preferred platform currently, but we're, we have used others in the past and we're going on to a different platform quite shortly. Um, but whatever platform you're using for an appellate hearing, um, there's not a great deal of difference. I mean, I think most judges obviously prefer to have a hearing in person, but given that you've already got you know, um, a trial record, you've got a trial decision, uh, and it's just legal arguments on the appeal, doing it virtually works perfectly well. Of course, at first instance, it's a bit of a different story. Um, if it's simply a, a hearing involving written evidence, then again, the situation is the same. You can do it almost as well uh, by doing it virtually. And indeed, of course, there are certain advantages in terms of access. So, for example, parties don't need to travel. You know, their representatives can stay wherever there are. And of course, with intellectual property being such an international uh, area of dispute, uh, many of the parties are based abroad. Uh, and so it actually has some advantages. Where it gets difficult or, or, or more difficult is with witnesses. Now in the civil jurisdiction, that's not a major problem for this reason. Even before the pandemic, uh, we were increasingly using uh, video um, conferencing to take the evidence of witnesses who were located outside the country. Um, for reasons of efficiency and cost saving. So when I was a, a trial judge, uh, I had plenty of cases in which one or more witnesses uh, were based abroad. 
to give you just a simple little illustration, it's not an IP case, but one of the strangest cases that, that I heard when I was a first instance judge was a dispute between uh, two branches of a Taiwanese family over ownership of a plot of land in Taiwan. Um, and the reasons why this dispute would be heard by a court in England, we don't need to go into. Um, I, I think both parties considered it to be a neutral venue. Um, but whatever the reasons, um, and there was a jurisdictional excuse for doing it, which I, 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 I won't go into. But unsurprisingly, given the facts that I've already outlined to you, most of the witnesses, of course, were Taiwanese. Um, and most of them gave evidence from Taiwan by video link. I think I had something like two out of about a dozen witnesses who gave evidence in person. Um, but as I say, most of them were giving evidence uh, while remaining in Taiwan and it worked just fine. Uh, where it gets more difficult is in the criminal jurisdiction um, because of juries. Uh, obviously jury trials are problematic, um, not least because of the problem of social distancing amongst the jurors. Uh, and the problem that we've had in this country with the criminal courts has been having courtrooms that are physically large enough that you can accommodate the jurors on a physically um, socially distanced basis um, together with judges and, and advocates and so on. Now, um, what's, what's happened is that um, um, after about six months of, of the pandemic, um, by that stage, uh, people have worked out how to go about this. And, and so what we, we've had since then is, is a number of the larger court, courtrooms around the country uh, operating jury trials and uh, um, jury trials and being heard in other buildings, so not normal courtrooms. Um, um, the, these have been called Nightingale Courts by on analogy with the Nightingale Hospitals. And so you know, um, various large um, halls and so on have been commandeered for this purpose uh, and jury trials are taking place. But the problem is that even with that, um, we're still not able to run as many jury trials as we did before. Uh, and so a considerable backlog has built up already uh, and is getting worse. Um, okay. So that's that's really the, the problem yeah, area. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, so getting, um, you've been on a court of appeal, what, for a year and a half or something, roughly, or? Just, just under that. So I, I was appointed at the beginning of October 2019. Okay. Uh, it's hard to say this early on, but did you, I don't want to use the word have fun, but was the trial court, court first instance, a patent court, or this court, um, not for talking about power or prestige, but just for what you do as a judge, um, which do you have a preference or is it easy? Yeah, I'm in a court of appeals. I prefer the court of appeal. Uh, but uh, I clerked for two judges and they both were, the, one was in the second circuit, one was in the southern district. And they both thought district court was a better position. Of course, they'd go up if they were asked and all that other stuff. But uh, what are your views on that? Well, I enjoyed being a first instance judge immensely, and I'm enjoying being in the Court of Appeal immensely. Um, they're both great jobs in slightly different ways. Uh, obviously, when you're at first instance in the High Court, you have the pleasure of, first of all, being the sole person um, who's hearing the case, uh, and therefore being in charge of the, the courtroom, um, and running the case the way you want to run it. Um, secondly, you have the immense privilege, particularly in, in IP cases, of very able advocates um, presenting their arguments. And, and over and above that, um, the even greater privilege of hearing the expert witnesses in patent cases. And one of the wonderful things about trying patent cases is we get very distinguished experts coming along to explain the technology to us. And 
I always really enjoyed um, um, hearing the expert witnesses. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and we, you know, we're privileged in this country because although there's a lot of cynicism worldwide about expert witnesses and the proposition that they're just hired guns saying what uh, their party is, the parties instructing them, uh, are paying them to say. In, in this country, we very rarely had that problem. Almost all of the expert witnesses we have testifying in the Patents Court are leaders in their field. They know their reputations are at stake, and they come to court to give us the benefit of their genuine uh, opinions and their scientific and technical expertise. Um, and you know, what you find is that um, frequently the experts um, turn out to be very largely in agreement on, on many points. Um, where they're in disagreement, it's either because there is a genuine scientific um, disagreement, uh, and that can be fascinating, or they're disagreeing for, for reasons that are actually not to do with the science, but to do with the patent aspects. Um, and that's perfectly understandable. Uh, but it's a great pleasure. Uh, of course, the advantages of sitting in the court appeal are to some extent uh, are, are the converse. Um, on the one hand, um, of course, it, you're sitting not on your own, but with uh, two colleagues. And so you have the pleasure of being on a collegiate court and being able to discuss the case with uh, your two colleagues. And that's, that adds a completely different dimension, uh, which so far I, I found very interesting and enjoyable. To this extent, that I would say that some of the most interesting cases that I've had in the Court of Appeal have been ones where the panel has been split. Um, you know, if everybody's agreed on the, on the outcome, that can be fine. You, you can still have a very interesting case, but it gets even more interesting if the bench is split um, because then you're debating amongst yourselves as to, to what the right answer, as well as with the advocates. And, and I've found that absolutely fascinating. Um, there is the downside of not, not he hearing the witnesses, but on the other hand, the advantage that that carries with it is that a lot of the hard work in, uh, on the case has been done for you by the trial judge. Now, I was notorious when I was sitting in the patent court for rendering uh, lengthy judgments, but I didn't do it for the sake of it. Um, there were reasons why the judgments were, were long. Um, the first and foremost reason was that frequently at first instance, you have a, a large number of issues to decide, both factual and legal. But by the time the case comes on appeal, You've got fewer issues, particularly on the factual side. Um, generally speaking, that there won't be any factual issues, um, and so it's it's mainly uh, just legal issues, and so you can concentrate on those. Um, uh, uh, and so, a lot of what you might call the grunt work um, that you have to do at first instance, you don't have to do in the court of appeal, um, and that gives you a little more time and leisure to think about um, some of the complicated legal points that come up. So, I, I, as I say, I, I enjoyed sitting at first instance. I'm enjoying sitting in the, in the Court of Appeal as okay. well. Okay. Um, so, CJ, you uh, uh, used to be ECJ. Um, you have, uh, what, the most, I think, re references of, of anybody, 14 or something along those lines. Um, first question is, uh, do you have that many references because the court opinions are so unclear, uh, that you need them to look at it again, or is it that your situation is so novel, uh, they've never looked at it before. So a combination of, well, so it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I need to um, try and explain it a little bit. It's true to say that I made 14 references to the Court of Justice, uh, and I'm not aware that any other individual judge has made so many. Um, but one needs to put that into context. 
Firstly, those references were made over a period of nearly 15 years, um, starting in 2004 through to uh, 2019. So I actually at, was averaging only about one a year, slightly less than one a year, if anything. Um, secondly, of course, part of the reason why I was making references was because of doing intellectual property cases. And um, we have a number of areas of intellectual property law which are extensively harmonized. So notably trademarks, um, copyright uh, designs, of course, um, copyright to a fairly large extent, and also supplementary protection certificates. Um, so we've got all those different areas of law which are um, uh, uh, substantially EU harmonized. And therefore, when um, legal questions came up, the ultimate arbiter, this of course being pre-Brexit, was not any domestic court, but the CJEU. So if you wanted to find out what the answer was, then the obvious thing to do was to refer to the CJEU. And in the course of that time, um, we, we had learned in this country that there wasn't a lot of point if you got a clearly referable point, leaving it to the appellate courts, because uh, if you did that, um, all you were doing was imposing delay and cost on the parties. So if sitting in the patents court, for example, I have a case about a supplementary protection certificate, and it's clear that there's a point that needs to be referred to the Court of Justice. Well, it made sense for me to do it rather than wait for the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court to do it uh, for those reasons. Uh, and so you know, it, we got pretty much into the habit of doing that in, in appropriate cases. Uh, and that of course, creates a dynamic of its own. So again, supplementary protection certificates is a very good example of this. What happened was that the pharmaceutical industry um, and their professional advisors across Europe soon came to learn that here you had a specialist court, which was expert in this field, um, which was ready, willing, and able to make references to the course of justice um, where that was needed. And so it, what happened was that they, they brought the cases before us because they, they knew that they could um, get the issue sorted out. Um, and of course, you know, it didn't necessarily mean that they were going to get a decision in their favor, um, but at least they would find out what the law was. Um, and generally speaking, that's what the parties wanted to do. So there were a number of, of reasons for that. It's true to say that in some of these fields, um, the decisions of the Court of Justice have a habit of um, creating a need for further references. Uh, so again, SPCs is, is a very good example of this. Um, the Court of Justice was faced with a real problem and you have to, anybody has to acknowledge this. The, the legislation was drafted incredibly simplistic, simplistically and in a way that failed to foresee the problems that were going to arise. And so any court interpreting the legislation it has a real headache in trying to devise sensible solutions because the solutions are simply not there in the legislation. You put on top of that the fact that the Court of Justice has no background in patents. Um, and uh, they're trying to deal with a problem that sits at the interface between the patent system and the regulatory system, and they're faced with a real problem. So it's not surprising really, that, that in some of their early decisions in the field, they stumbled uh, and they um, handed down decisions which were uh, not clear and or not well reasoned. Uh, and that then led to a need to make further references but I think one must give credit where credit is due. Um, over time, I think the Court of Justice has been on a learning curve with respect to SPCs. And over time, partly as a result of references from the English Patents Court, their jurisprudence in that field has got better. Um, they've started to see where the problems are and how they can be solved. 
uh, and uh, I think the, the case law is in much better shape now than it was, say, five years ago. Yeah, well, uh, well now, we have, now we have Brexit, uh, which, technically speaking, uh, their law is not going to be controlling uh, in the UK. Uh, but the globalization is a tendency of courts to look at other courts in other countries uh, for instance, uh, UK, Germany, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I think there have been some um, help or looking to them and seeing what they're doing. Or, you know, of course, it could be the US or something else. Do uh, uh, you think that is still going to go on? That courts will look to uh, outside of the UK or people outside the UK will look to you. I'm talking about judges now. Uh, and it, of course, you, you realize all this has happened because of the Fordham IP conference. I don't want to take complete credit for it. but uh, So to what extent is this sharing or thinking or interplay um, to the extent it did exist, the extent that will continue, or is everyone going to go into their own little uh, place, the UK and uh, Europe? Well, I don't see why Brexit should make a difference so far as that particular aspect um, of judicial practice is concerned. I mean, courts in this country have had a long tradition of looking to case law from courts of other countries for inspiration when dealing with problems. And you can identify a number of distinct phases of this. So the first phase was the what one might call the Commonwealth phase. So to give a simple example, uh, it was commonplace in this country um, even before we joined the what was then the European Economic Community, latterly the EU, for courts in this country to look at the, the jurisprudence of the Commonwealth courts. Um, so you, know, you can go back to the 1960s, say, look at decisions in the House of Lords as it then was, now the Supreme Court, uh, and you will find frequently reference to decisions of the High Court of Australia or the Supreme Court of Canada uh, and so on. So, um, and that was, of course, because they were all part of the same common law system. Um, and you know, if you are talking, for example, about contract law, the basics of contract law were the same throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, and so um, the courts in this country uh, knew that uh, they could get assistance by looking at decisions, particularly uh, authoritative decisions from courts of, of, of other Commonwealth countries. So that's stage one. Stage two is that even independently of the EU, um, from the 1970s onwards, what I would call the comparative law method became increasingly uh, influential. And what I mean by that is that um, you know, the academic discipline of com comparative law really got going um, in the 1970s and following. And that had quite an influence on the approach of the judges. Um, because back in the day, I think the attitude of a lot of English judges was that leaving aside the Commonwealth exception, where it was very largely the same law, um, there was a, a bit of a, a mentality of, well, we know best, what have we got to learn from other legal systems? But then the comparative lawyers showed the judges that actually, if you look at other legal systems, what you find is that they've come across, had to face up to a lot of the same problems, and it can be very instructive to see how different legal systems have tackled these problems. So, if you've got a problem in the law of tort, for example, and you've got a problem as to, let us say, I don't know, scope of recoverable damages, 
well, this is not just a problem that we have to face in this country. On the contrary, any court that's dealing with tort claims um, is liable to have to deal with these kind of problems. And so it can be very instructive to see how, for example, a civil law system uh, deals with that kind of a problem. And so what the comparative lawyers did was they started comparing how, for example, French and German law would tackle problems like that um, as compared with how English law. Um, and then what happened was that academic articles written in that way were being cited in particular in the House of Lords um, or the Court of Appeal. And so the judges were educated in the comparative law method and they learned that yes, actually this could be quite educational. And so you know, since that time you know, through the 80s, 90s uh, and into this century, um, it started to become increasingly common, particularly in the House of Lords and the Supreme Court, for them to be looking not just at the Commonwealth jurisprudence, but also from the jurisprudence from civil law systems to see how they tackled these kind of problems and whether the, any inspiration could be gained from them. Uh, and I see no reason why that should stop. On the contrary, I think what the exercise has taught us all is that we all have much to learn from each other, just as we hope that uh, courts in other countries um, can sometimes gain assistance from us, we can learn from them. And by working together in that way, learning from each other, hopefully we can all arrive at better solutions. Um, the third dimension is of course the EU dimension. And really that has, has, has been in some ways part of the same exercise again uh, we that has taught us that there are things that can be learnt um, from supranational courts uh, and in parallel that with that of course we've had the, the jurisprudence from the european court of human rights and again uh, since the advent of the human rights act um, in this country which came into operation in 2000 uh, we've had the uh, exercise of looking at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights as well as the Court of Justice of the EU. And I think many of us have found again that that's been an educational exercise. So I, I don't foresee that the general principle of um, learning from others is going to stop even though EU law is no longer supreme and therefore decisions of the Court of Justice are no longer binding. Okay, uh, one my final question on this. Uh... Civil law, supposedly every case is a case, there's no precedence. Uh, common law, obviously, is, is exactly the opposite. Uh, CJU is supposed to be civil law. It seems to me, basically, almost more important the decision, the more it's gonna follow, look to precedent, uh, so people can make some sort of action with some idea of what's gonna happen in the future. So practically speaking, de facto, is at least in uh, Supreme Courts and all, is it, would you say that every jurisdiction, at least the CJU and major European jurisdictions, are now basically doing precedence count and we look to those? Or is it, you want? My answer, my answer to that question would be yes. Um, I think the distinction between common law and civil law is much exaggerated so far as uh, precedent is concerned. It is a basic principle of justice that you treat like cases alike and you treat different cases differently. And as soon as you accept that, it forces you into some degree of precedence. You can't operate a system without it because otherwise it's anarchy. Um, and the practical reality is that the civil law systems do it. So let's take, for example, the way the French do it. Now, the French start from a proposition which everybody can agree with, which is to say that we believe in democracy. The law is created by the legislature, that which is the body which has democratic legitimacy. Uh, and therefore, the French say, the source of the law is the legislation. There is no other source. Well, 
we can all agree with that up to a point. But the problem with that as a matter of practical reality is that, of course, no legislation can ever be entirely prescriptive. The practical operation of the law requires interpretation of the legislation and application to the facts of a particular case. And that's the job of the courts. And in, in carrying out that job, the courts necessarily um, have to be consistent. If they're not consistent, as I said a moment ago, it's anarchy. And so the practical reality is that uh, everybody operates to some degree on a basis of precedent. And the way it works in France is through the concept of la doctrine. So uh, classically, you won't find citation of judgments in um, uh, uh, French judgments. Um, what they will do is they will cite um, the, the text and the text will be based on the previous decisions. Um, uh, and that's just a different way of handling precedent. Um, the practical reality is much the same. Now, it is quite true to say that no civilian system has strict precedent in the way that we do, but that's really a difference of degree rather than a fundamental way of operation. And I think the point is, is brought quite well home by the way in which the Court of Justice operates, because the Court of Justice does not adhere to strict precedent. And in that sense, you are absolutely correct to say that it operates more on the civil law model than it does on the common law model. However, if you look at Court of Justice decisions, you will find repeatedly statements like, it is settled case law that, and then they will cite their own previous decisions, um, and frequently a whole bunch of them. So if you look at the way that the Court of Justice operates in practice, it is operating a system of precedent. Um, they are free to depart from their own previous decisions, and from time to time they do so. Um, uh, uh, but nevertheless, the fact of the matter is, it is a precedent-based system. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I think one of the reasons is the civil law system started out with the Napoleonic Code, all this, everything else. Everything was dictated and there was basically dispute resolution if you sued someone. Now the courts are deciding major issues of policy that affect millions of people and whatever that mechanism that was created on just X sues Y, uh, and let's let's get at the result now is is much different, and uh, as you say, uh, you almost have to, on, in in modern time, do that. Um, so, okay, now, first, your your background. Um, uh, I take it you're English. Yeah. Correct. And um, if you go. Although, uh, although I'm proud to say that, like many English people, uh, I have um, roots that are in part from outside England. And in my particular case, I'm proud to be one quarter Alsatian, <laughs> meaning that my grandfather came from Alsace, which is these days uh, a part of France, although in history it's been contested territory. So your grandfather was German or French? Well, he, he, he spoke three languages. Um, he spoke French because that was what his parents spoke. He spoke German because when he was a child, um, it was the, Alsace was under the control of Germany. Uh, and with his school friends, he spoke Alsatian dialect, which is a bit like Svitadich. Um, uh, and he then, came to this country uh, and spoke English. Um, if you asked him, uh, he would have said that he was an Alsatian first and foremost, but if choosing between France and Germany, he was very firmly in the camp of France. Uh, be choosing between then, which one would he choose? Oh, France. France. Okay, okay, good. Um, all right, uh, so you started out uh, in chemistry, uh, technology. Um, how was that? Was that 
Uh, how did you do that? Was that just naturally because of your interest or your parents were in there? Or how, how did you end up in chemistry in school? Um, just of out of interest, uh, my parents were both lawyers uh, and that neither of them had a technical background of any description whatsoever. But when I was at school, I enjoyed science. I enjoyed all the subjects, but I particularly enjoyed science. And the subject that I enjoyed the most was chemistry. And so I chose to study that at university. And at that stage, um, I should confess that my attitude was that lawyers were parasites. And the last thing I was ever going to do was be a lawyer. Um, well, it just goes to show, doesn't it? Um, so I went off to university and did, uh, did chemistry, um, uh, but uh, for various reasons, which I can explain if, if you're interested, um, uh, having done a four year degree in chemistry, uh, I then decided that that was enough and uh, had to cast around for something else to do with my life. And at that point, uh, ended up turning to the okay, law. Okay, let me ask you this. Uh, does your brain have to be formulated in a certain way? to be able to really do technology. I mean, I, I don't think I could do it. So I'm an example of someone who was liberal arts and that's what I'm gonna be. So in terms of either students uh, who might wanna go into technology driven law or something else, should we really tell them you should have science background and everything else uh, or that you can adapt at certain point and be as effective in that as someone with science background or is it the I the brain has to be that way in some way does that make sense well it's there's two aspects to it aren't there first of all is natural aptitude and the second is education so I certainly would agree that in order to do technically complex cases you need to have the natural aptitude whether you need to have the education is another matter. Um, certainly in, in this country, it is true to say that most people who do patent work um, have science, technology, engineering, mathematics or medical degrees. Um, and that has become steadily more true over time as science and technology has moved on. Uh, however, I would not say it's essential to have a degree in a STEM subject, provided that you've got the natural aptitude. And the great example I always like to quote uh, is my late colleague, Henry Carr, um, who was a brilliant patent uh, barrister and judge, but he did not have a degree um, in a STEM subject. He had a law degree. Uh, and he simply had the natural aptitude that he was able to cope with uh, dauntingly complex technical cases, despite not having had that level of formal, edu formal education in the subject. Um, so I don't think it's essential, but it's certainly helpful okay. to have the okay, education. Okay, so you're in a court of appeal now, and you have three judges, and a technology case, let's call it patent, comes up, and the other two have not had uh, let's say the birthright of being able to do this or the education, uh, but have look at this in a way that might be different than looking at it, someone who has that background. Does that ever come up? Yep. That the liberal arts person might see the case this way, whereas the technology uh, science person sees it this way. Um, or not? I mean, does that affect judges at that level, would you say, how they approach it? Well, I'm firmly of the view that judges with a liberal arts background have a contribution to make. Um, and as to some extent we've touched on already, what we're talking about is the application of the law to technical facts. Now, <clears throat> of course, there is a barrier to understanding in terms of the technical facts. That's where your natural aptitude and your education come in. But once you've got over that 
barrier and have got a sufficient understanding of the technical facts, then we're applying the law. And in terms of applying the law, a judge with a liberal arts background is perfectly well equipped to do so because what they have is the training in the law over many years, the experience as judges solving legal problems. And those skill sets are just as relevant, uh, even in patent cases, let alone um, um, soft IP cases, uh, trademarks and copyright. So yes, of course, they've got a, a great deal to contribute. Okay, so what, to what extent um, do judges make the law uh, as opposed to simply either following precedent or uh, the legislation or something, or that they actually look at all these facts and say, as a policy matter, this should be the result, and maybe that's the way they're going to go. But well, the expression, do judges make the law or not? How do you come out on that? Well, I subscribe, <coughs> excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. Um, I subscribe to the view that was um, pronounced over 50 years ago by one of the greatest English judges of the 20th century, who was Lord Reed, who was a dominant figure in the House of Lords for quite a long period of time. And towards the end of his career in the late 60s or early 70s, I forget exactly when, he gave a lecture um, in which he said, in relation to the idea that judges don't make the law, he said, we don't believe in fairy stories anymore. Um, it is a fairy story to say that judges don't make the law. Of course, judges make the law. Uh, and in common law jurisdictions, they make the law in two distinct ways. First of all, going back to what I was saying earlier, where we have legislation, it's the job of the judiciary to interpret the legislation and apply it to the facts. And it is through the process of interpretation and application that law becomes living law. It's all very well to write legislation, but the question is how does it work in actual practice when you have to apply it to real facts? And of course, our job as judges is to be servants of the legislature. It's not our job to be masters. So we have to try and ascertain as best we can the legislative intention and how it can be most faithfully put into effect in concrete cases. But even though we're trying as hard as we possibly can, to be faithful to the legislative intention. The practical reality is that in deciding how the law is to be applied, we are to some small extent making the law. Uh, and that's why precedent is so important. And again, the Court of Justice's jurisprudence provides a very good illustration of this because they are they're interpreting texts all the time. They're interpreting the treaties, they're interpreting the regulations, the directives, so they're always engaged in the interpretation of, in that case, European legislation, but nevertheless, the practical reality is, to some degree, they make the law. So that's the first aspect. But then, of course, in a common law system, we have something else again, which is the purely judge-made law. When we talk about the common law, what are we talking about? We are talking about a system of law which involves law being created through the accretion of individual decision, judicial decisions one by one over a long period of time. Uh, and as many of our listeners will know, but some may not, uh, this is a system that in England we've been operating for over 800 years. So it has a very long ped pedigree. And what happens is that through individual decisions in individual cases, over time, a body of case law can be built up, which establishes principles, which can then be applied to future cases. And there are whole areas of English law, which are still almost entirely uh, common law based, um, sometimes with a degree of legislative modification. So 
two central areas we have, which are still very substantially common law based, a contract and the law of negligence. These are still to this day, almost entirely judge made, uh, built up over the centuries, albeit that there have been some legislative um, uh, changes in certain small areas. We also have the system which is called equity, which is just a, a name for another form of judge made law. This is judge made law built by the built up by the courts of equity um, since slightly later in time. Yeah, the courts of equity have only been going for 600 years rather than 800 years. Um, but nevertheless, it, again, it goes back a long way. Okay, so uh, equity and, and is basically stand back. We're really going to make the law now. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Well, well, equity is, is, is a beautiful example of how competition between courts can sometimes be beneficial, because what, you, what was going on there was that you, know, you had the courts of equity competing with the common law courts, um, and it started out, of course, with the view that morally they were superior. Um, I mean, that's, that's where it all started from. But what it evolved into was a system of refinement of the law through judicial competition. Uh, and equity prevailed where it did prevail, which was not always, because it came up with a superior solution. So let me give you a simple example. It was the courts of equity which invented the remedy of an injunction. That was a, a remedy that was unknown to the common law. The courts of equity invented it um, and it, that invention prevailed because everybody came to appreciate that actually to have a workable system of enforcement of the law, you need the remedy of an injunction. Simply having damages as a remedy is not good enough. So that innovation of the courts of equity stood the test of time. Oh, well, that's a very good example. Let's go to your private life again. Um, you apparently claim to be an academic Oh, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so the day job, which is how I earn my living, was for, first as a barrister and secondly uh, as um, a judge. But um, uh, at a very early stage of, of being a lawyer, I got interested in the academic side of the law. Uh, and so I started writing articles um, and that led to writing books, um, which led to writing more articles, participating in seminars uh, with academic colleagues, coming to such wonderful events as the Fordham IP conference and learning from academic colleagues, uh, and then collaborating with academics and so on. And so the practical result is that for quite a large number of years now, I've had uh, what in reality amounts to a parallel career as a part-time, independent, unpaid academic. Um, and you could say perhaps that that was formalized when I was appointed as a vis visiting professor uh, at the University of Westminster, but that really um, simply is, is, is a title for something that I was already doing. But what is it in for that you get out of this, that you're willing, you work, you're probably the hardest working person on the face of the earth. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I have worked hard over my career, um, but what I've tried to do above all is not to work hard, but to work efficiently, which is different. Um, both at the bar and on the bench, I've often found my colleagues working longer hours um, but I try to be extremely efficient with my it, time. It comes down to actually you're just smarter than them. Isn't that really what it comes down to? No, 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 no. I'm not cleverer, but I do think I make good use of my time. Okay. So what do you, as an academic, what courses or course do you, you teach, right? Something or not? Well, I don't teach to any regular courses, but what I do do is, is give a lot of, of individual lectures on, on an ad hoc basis. Give me the idea what those uh, lectures are. What do they cover? Well, any subject that um, the institution and I agree on would be of interest. So, I mean, uh, 
a, a, a concrete example of that is that I've given a lot of lectures, um, both in academic settings to students um, and in, in other settings um, over the past few years on the subject of website blocking. Um, it so happens that I issued the first decision on website blocking in this country back in 2011 and uh, um, issued a number of decisions after that as a consequence. Um, and that proved to be something that has been of, of great interest all around the world. Uh, and so I found myself being asked to speak about it, both to students in universities uh, and at okay, so conferences and seminars. Where are we now in website blocking in terms of the law? And is it different in countries? Is it generally now harmonizing or what's going on? With it? So I think there's a slow to convergence. Um, so there's a fair degree of convergence within the EU um, and including for this purpose, the UK, because we've only just left in those terms. Um, there's not a hundred percent convergence within the EU just yet, but it's there's a there's a fair degree of convergence. Um, globally, um, there's more diverse um, outcomes and, and approaches, but again, I think the general trend is 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 one of divergent uh, convergence. Um, I think most legal systems recognise these days that there is a practical need for this sort of remedy. Um, uh, and given that they recognize the practical need for the remedy, they find ways of making the remedy available. And although it's true to say that technology, of course, moves on, and therefore the type of remedy you need moves on, I don't think that affects the basic principle. So. To explain what I mean by that, um, it's already the case that blocking access um, to static websites is of much less interest than it used to be, um, because you know, that's not where the infringing activity is so much these days, particularly in terms of uh, consumption of copyright content, as everybody knows, where it's at nowadays is streaming. So when you're looking at streaming, what you're interested in is not so much blocking access to a static website. What you're interested in is blocking access to infringing streams. But what we found in this jurisdiction was that we could apply the same approach uh, that we had established in relation to website blocking to blocking access to streaming servers. And it works very well. Okay. Um, your Supreme Court, um, uh, I don't know much about it, but I've read some of their opinions and I get the idea they're not getting it right in IP, at least uh, not recently, but I've seen a number of cases where I thought maybe they weren't. Uh, that may, I may be alone in that, as opposed to the lower courts in the UK. Uh, are you finding anything? Uh, maybe there aren't that many cases going up, but is, in fact, is the Court of Appeal basically most likely to be the Supreme Court and IP, or is the Supreme Court going to have an effective, I don't know, voice in this? Well, the numbers of cases that go on appeal from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court are obviously small. Uh, our Supreme Court, um, like the US Supreme Court, um, only takes a small number of cases per year. Um, and um, therefore they are selective. Um, and depending on you know, what the caseload of applications for permission is, they may take fewer um, IP cases or more IP cases. And if you look at the trend over time, sometimes they take relatively few, at other times they take more. As it happens in the past uh, few years, I think we've had more decisions um, uh, from the Supreme Court than at many earlier periods, um, uh, looking back over the history of the Supreme Court and its predecessor, the House of Lords. So currently, it is certainly not true to say that the Court of Appeal effectively has the last word. On the contrary, 
there were, there were a sufficient number of cases going forward to the Supreme Court uh, for there to be a, you know, a healthy degree of review by the Supreme Court. Equally, it is not, it wouldn't be true to think that the Supreme Court here is constantly overturning the Court of Appeal. On the, on the contrary, um, in recent decisions, they've been upholding the Court of Appeal for the most part. Um, there have been relatively few surprises uh, coming out of the Supreme Court. There have been some in the past, um, but it, it, it's, you know, it's not the case that you, know, you go to the Supreme Court and uh, every time the Court of Appeal uh, gets reversed, on the contrary. I, I realize that. Uh, okay, so now we have your book on performers' rights. How did that develop? Well, despite being a creature of habit, I'm also a lover of serendipity. Um, and it's a curious story. So the way it works is this. When I started out training to be a barrister, um, I need to, to, to earn some money, like many people in that situation. And one of the ways I, I earned some money um, was by doing uh, what we call law reporting. So what law reporting means is a judgment has been handed down by a court and you've got to then put that into a form um, that will be published in a series of law reports. And the primary task of the law reporter is to write what we call a head note, um, which is a short pricey of the decision. Um, so what you have to do is you have to have a short pricey of the facts of the case, uh, and then a short pricey of the uh, uh, findings of the court. Um, and this is a very good thing for a, a young lawyer to do. I mean, in my case, I was originally motivated to do it, as I have explained, by wanting to earn some money. I got paid for doing this. Um, but it was a very useful exercise because if you have to proceed the facts shortly, and more importantly, you have to proceed the decision in a legally accurate way, it's a real valuable training on um, uh, the law. Particularly, what you think, one of the things you have to do is to extract the ratio decidendi from the case. And particularly if you've got an appellant decision with multiple um, um, speeches or, or, or opinions, uh, then that may not be very easy. So it's, it's wonderful training for a lawyer. Anyway, one of the cases that I was asked to report was a decision uh, of the Court of Appeal in a case involving the British actor Peter Sellers, um, uh, who made a series uh, of films, which everybody will know, for United Artists, um, um, which was the Pink Panther series of films. And after he died, um, United Artists put out a sixth film without the consent of Sellers or his estate, which was comprised very largely of clips and outtakes from the previous five. And so the estate brought proceedings, um, partly for breach of contract, but partly for what we would now call infringement of performers' rights. And so I wrote um, um, a head note um, summarizing the decision of the Court of Appeal. And I got extremely interested in what the court had had to say on the performers' rights question. So having written my head note, um, I then wrote an article on the subject, um, all about the performers' rights dimension. In particular, because although it seemed to me that the court had reached the, the right decision, the reasons that it given seemed to me to be rather suspect. Um, and so um, I, I got interested in that, particularly because it involved looking at the international um, legislation uh, on the subject in the form of the Rome Convention. Uh, and so that involved looking at, um, at the records of the conference, the Rome Convention, and all kinds of stuff like that. So it got very interesting. Uh, and around the same time, um, we had a new Copyright Act in this country, which was the Copyright Designs and Patterns Act 1988, which put the whole protection of, of performers' rights onto a new statutory basis. So after I'd written my article, I got the idea, hey, wouldn't it be useful to write a book about 
um, performers' rights, which would first of all cover the old law, which had been the subject of the Court of Appeal decision, and then introduce the new law in the 1988 Act. So that's how I came to write, write the book. Um, and that came out in 1990. So I'm astonished to think it's, that's uh, now over 30 years ago. Um, and I found that a very enjoyable and interesting exercise. And um, I've had the support of my publishers to produce uh, a number of subsequent editions. And I'm currently putting the finishing touches to a sixth edition, which will be published later this year. Yeah, well, I actually think, uh, Richard, that you're, pro you're probably one of the most productive people I've ever met in my life. Um, well, that's fantastic. Uh, now, what are you doing with that money? You're about buying a second house from this book or what? <laughs> Certainly not. No, it's a very niche subject. Um, and it's never sold very many copies. It's, so it's, I, I think I can say without false modesty that uh, uh, the uh, book has a good reputation, but not many people actually buy it. Well, first um, of all, what does but, it cost? Oh, it's quite expensive. Law books in this country are incredibly expensive. Well, give us an um, idea. Um, frankly, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, th I think the fifth edition retailed for something like 180 pounds. So it's quite a lot yeah, of money. Uh, you know, it's worth it. Uh, so we, we will now, IP Institute is going to buy this and uh, it better be good. That's all I'm saying. All right. Uh, Okay, so trade secrets apparently is something that interests you. Yes, indeed uh, it is. How did yes. that happen? So it, it happened through my practice at the bar where um, I got involved in litigating um, a small number of trade secrets cases. Um, and again, I got interested because in the first place, trade secrets are a very strange area of the law because it's a bit like litigating a patent without a patent. So if you've got all the stuff about understanding the technology and encapsulating the technical advance um, that, that you know, the, the claimant is trying to protect, um, but you don't have a patent setting it all out for you. Uh, and so that pre presents quite a challenge. Um, and you've got the same aspect that you've got in pat patent cases of, of, of particularly in you know, technical trade secrets cases of, of, of understanding the technology and you know, um, listening to the expert witnesses. So a lot of the interest there is the same. But the other thing that, that attracted my attention was that this was one of these areas of judge made law. So trade secrets protection up until very recently in this country has been entirely um, uh, based on equity, so one of the two areas of judge-made law. Uh, and it was something that equity had had a stab at uh, dealing with, but until relatively recently had, had struggled with, I think it's fair to say. So we had some good foundations um, in the 19th century case law, particularly a famous case involving the Prince of Wales' etchings. Um, it's funny how royalty continued to shape our law even now. Um, but um, it, it, there was some struggles in adapting those principles to modern conditions. But then there was some, some the, the, there was the famous case of the, um, the, 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 the spy catcher book, which was litigated both in Australia and in this country. And that pushed the development of the law forward um, quite a lot. Uh, and so then the question was, you know, applying that, that, that development to the technical trade secrets cases. And, and it's, it's been a very interesting journey and it continues to be an interesting area of the law. And now, of course, we've got the EU Trade Secrets Directive, um, which has brought a degree of harmonization uh, across the EU. And we're still uh, going to be applying that in for, for the foreseeable for, for the for the short to medium term because this is part of retained EU law uh, under the Brexit legislation. Uh, and did they do a good job with that directive? Trade secrets. Um, well, it's an, it's a very interesting piece of legislation for this reason that um, 
as is so often the case, the commission was faced with the problem of how do you harmonize all these different systems? And you've got both differences of legal approach and differences of practical approach. So you've got the difference between the, the common law jurisdictions, which were dealing with this on the basis of equity, and the civil law jurisdictions, which by and large were looking at it as a question of unfair competition. Um, then you've got the fact that trade secrets, although it's not technically in many ways part of intellectual property law, because of course, information is not property. Nevertheless, it's very similar to intellectual property law in many ways. Then you've got practical issues such as how do you protect the trade secrets in the course of litigation? You need to have court procedures that allow the trade secrets to be protected. And that's something that up until the Trade Secrets Directive, some um, countries really struggled with. Uh, and the reason why they struggled with it was because they just didn't have a thing in anything in their procedural code that really met the need. And so I think the, the, the commission has done quite a good job in producing a piece of legislation that both fits the background of the common law jurisdictions and the, the civil law jurisdictions, solves the procedural problems, and moreover, does a, quite a nice job of applying a set of, of enforcement remedies that are really very similar to those that we find in the IP enforcement directive, and therefore create a fair degree of commonality between the system for uh, it, trade secrets protection and the system for IP protection. Okay. All right, we're running out of time. The final topic is uh, new IP appointments. Uh, is that something you want to say something about? Well, just for those who don't know, we're going through a period of rapid judicial change in this jurisdiction. Um, so, of course, very tragically, uh, um, just over a year, year ago, a uh, little over a year ago, 18 months ago, we lost uh, Henry Carr from the bench, yeah, who died far too young Henry from cancer, and that was that was a great loss. Um, in addition, we've had David Kitchens being promoted to the Supreme Court. Um, I have, uh, as already mentioned, uh, been in the Court of Appeals since October 2019. As of this week, Colin Burse has just joined me uh, in the Court of Appeal, uh, and uh, to replace us, we've got two uh, new first instance judges in the Patents Court, uh, Richard Mead, uh, um, who joined last September, and uh, James Mellor, who will be uh, joining in just over a week. Uh, so it's a bit of all change, but the good news is that you know, uh, the new recruits are extremely experienced and able IP practitioners who will be familiar to uh, many. So although it's change, it's also continuity. Okay, let me ask you this. You, you now have two uh, IP people in the Court of Appeals. Is it likely you'll both be on the same case or are they gonna split you up so that it's, it's just gonna be one of you on an IP case? So it will vary depending on um, the workload and um, just practical considerations. But if you look at what happened when both David Kitchen and Christopher Floyd were in the Court of Appeal, on quite a few cases they sat together, but there were also a number of cases where it was just one of them sitting. Okay, good. And um, see, Christopher is, re is retiring. That's correct, yes. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. I uh, hope you enjoyed this as much as I did and our listeners. Uh, uh, Indeed I have. It's been a, a, a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, April 8th, April 9th, be there or be square. Well, it is the Davos of IP, yes, of course. Yes. Okay, Richard, thanks so much. It's Stay a pleasure safe. to you. Goodbye. Stay safe.